just going to give you some um, very, very brief information about this program and another one, a related one. So the idea was for the industry to get talent, and that means undergraduate, graduate, PhD students, and postdocs, of which you are one, um, while the QDC is expanding. And they did expand. Um, and there were two programs that were growing together. One was the this one with the students who have, or postdocs who have work that they want to showcase, and the industry members would be interested in maybe making them office and interns and so on. But there was a second program, which is called office hours, where students come and they get mentors, uh, which are basically people from the industry. Uh, so we, we try to keep these two programs together. For example, let's say that today you have this presentation and so does Nishad, but there aren't many people here. And like I said, we pretend it's a TV program and they look at it a little bit later. And the question is how, how can they get in touch with you? Um, and one option would be through the um, office hours, but you probably don't need a mentor anymore. You could be a mentor. That's yeah, maybe yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and you can still you can still uh, get in touch with um, various uh, individuals from the industry. Mm -hmm. For example, Robert Eads is from IBM. He oh, just joined. <laughs> <laughs> And more people are joining as it's almost three o'clock. And I'm, I'm looking for the, for the third presenter. Um, we could also, you know, get started and when he joins, he joins. You wanna get started, Werner? Whatever suits you best, um, that's fine for me. <laughs> okay. Well, so let me just uh, get started. Uh, this is the QEDC Workforce uh, Development TAC. And today is September 19, it's a Tuesday, 2023. Uh, we have our um, quantum talent showcase for uh, schedule for this month. Um, we have three people, three presenters in, uh, in the program. You see them all on the screen because I believe I'm uh, sh sharing the screen. Uh, the second presenter, Arniban Mukherjee, is not able to make it today, but uh, we do have uh, Werner Dobrovitz from uh, Charmes University of Technology. And soon, I think, we'll have Nishad Mascara from the Looking Group at Harvard um, ready to present uh, their presentations. So um, because it's 3 o'clock and because, you know, in the interest of time, we'll have 30 minutes per presenters, 25 minutes plus five questions and uh, answers, I would like to let Werner share his screen while I say just a few words to introduce him. So I'm going to stop sharing. And while uh, Bernard is setting up, um, I'm just going to say that um, as it was on the screen a few minutes ago, uh, Bernard has, um, uh, his undergraduate studies in physics at Graz University of Technology in Austria. He earned a PhD in theoretical chemistry under the supervision of Professor Ali Alavi at the Max Planck Institute of Solid State Research in Stuttgart, Germany. And currently he is a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden, where he is developing novel quantum computing algorithms to allow accurate quantum chemistry calculations on near-term quantum devices. So I'll, um, I'll say welcome, uh, Werner, and uh, take it away. Thanks for the nice introduction. Thanks for having me. I hope I'm not muted and everything works. Now I'm back in full screen. It's good. Yeah, yes. Perfect. I assume, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, as Adrian said, my talk today will be on how we get towered real chemical accuracy on current quantum hardware through the so called transcorrelated method and a short outline of my talk. Um, first, I will more um, in general talk about the motivation and the field of electronic structure theory and quantum chemistry uh, in a broad, broad strokes. Then I will introduce this uh, transcorrelated method, which is a correlated ansatz to reduce the computational footprint on quantum hardware. And in the end, I will show a few results uh, on the Hubbard model and up initial quantum chemistry problems before I conclude. So in the field of electronic structure theory, uh, we are interested in uh, a multitude of interesting systems. For example, um, 
high temperature uh, superconductors like the cuprates, uh, which where the two dimensional copper oxide planes are responsible uh, for the unconventional high TC superconductivity uh, of these materials. Or for example, uh, more chemical problems like the FIMOCO molecule, which is a primary cofactor in the nitrogenase process, which is like the conversion uh, of uh, nitrogen uh, into fertilizers by bacteria close to the roots of plants, or the manganese calcium oxygen clusters, which are uh, at the core of the oxygen evolving cluster in photosystem two, responsible for the conversion of light uh, and carbon dioxide to uh, or light energy to chemical energy uh, in plants. And what those systems have in common is that they are surprisingly small systems and they're responsible for very, very interesting and yet unsolved physical and chemical uh, properties. And they also have in common that they're usually very strongly correlated, which means that they are challenging systems uh, for computational approaches of today. But we do need an accurate theoretical understanding at the nanoscale to maybe have a bottom-up materials design uh, process uh, for these, uh, for these uh, processes. And the good thing about the field of up initio quantum chemistry uh, or electronic structure theory uh, in general is that we do have the fundamental equations at hand to get insight into these problems. Because if we want to have insight uh, into these physical and chemical properties of these materials like the ground state or excited state energies, energy differences, response functions, and so on, we need to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, of these systems where all necessary information of a quantum system is contained in this electronic molecular Hamiltonian H, where here in simplified form, it is given uh, with the ingredients of only the kinetic energy term uh, of the negatively charged electrons, an attractive potential between the positively charged nuclei and electrons, and this very cumbersome uh, electron uh, repulsion term. Uh, and this Coulomb repulsion between the negatively charged electrons correlates all the electrons of a quantum system, which means then that an analytic solution becomes way too complex and we need approximations and computational approaches to solve this Schrodinger equation uh, of quantum materials. And our target to uh, reemphasize again is that we want to have very highly, very high accuracy so that we are able to predict, interpret, and also compare with experimental results. And depending on how accurately we treat this uh, electron correlation, we get uh, various methods and levels of theory, like a hierarchy of methods, which uh, scales where like the accuracy and the cost of these methods scale with the system size of the problem at hand. And at the, the, the bottom of this uh, hierarchy, we have like mean field methods like Hartree-Fock or density functional theory, uh, where the electron correlation is only treated in a mean field way, which means, is, which means we get uh, low accuracy, but we can apply these methods to very, very large system sizes. While at the top, when, for example, we treat this uh, electron cor correlation exactly, we get the so-called full configuration interaction solution, which is the exact solution of a problem, but this uh, approach scales exponentially with the number of electrons and orbitals uh, in, in our system. And the idea behind my research is that I want to extend this reach and applicability of highly accurate methods to larger system sizes via the use of quantum computing approaches. Uh, and why does this... Uh, exact solution, the full configuration and the action solution scale exactly, it is due to the fact that if we formulate a quantum chemistry problem on, on our comp computational hardware, we usually uh, have to formulate it in some sort of basis. And the usual basis quantum chemists use are uh, the, the so-called basis sets, which are based on the, the hydrogen solutions uh, and thus resulting in these uh, commonly uh, looking S orbitals or P orbitals. And starting from a Hartree-Fox solution where we occupy the lowest energetical orbitals of our problem, 
in the full CI solution to get the exact solution, we actually have to consider all the possible uh, configurations of electrons with spin up and spin down indicated here by the arrows in these different type of orbitals of our quantum chemistry problem. This, however, means is that already for a very, very small system like the fluorine dimer, um, if we treat the full CI solution, uh, this is already at the limit uh, of current conventional hardware to get this exact solution uh, for, for systems like this, which is a bit disappointing. And this is kind of why people uh, are very uh, optimistic and make the case for quantum, so to say, in the field of quantum chemistry. And to sketch a little bit uh, why quantum computing uh, might provide a benefit, maybe let's compare uh, or let's start what we can encode with a classical bit. Like a classical bit can either encode the zero state, like the bit turned off, or a one state, the bit turned on. Uh, opposed to that, if we go to a quantum bit, as you might all have heard, is uh, a quantum bit can be in the superposition, like kind of a little bit in both the zero and the one state, with, of course, the restriction that uh, this, this state needs to be normalized. And we can uh, picture like the, the state of one qubit in this block sphere picture where like, for example, the zero state is indicated by this arrow pointing to the north pole of the, the block sphere. And similar to conventional bits on a computer, we can also act on these bits on quantum hardware, which is usually represented in the circuit model of uh, quantum computing, where the lines represent qubits, and we can act with operations on these qubits, like for example, a NOT gate, which then switches this zero state uh, to the one state, which is the, an arrow pointing to the south pole uh, of the block sphere. But opposed to classical bits, qubits can also be in the superposition between two states. For example, we can also rotate the qubit by 90 degrees around the x-axis and then end up in a state which is kind of either or and both one and zero. But of course, however, uh, if we then measure a qubit, it will still like there will be the collapse of the wave function and we will still get only a zero or a one out in the end, but with equal probability of the outcome zero and one. And one has to think about smart quantum algorithms to make use of this uh, superposition possibility of the qubits. And the good thing is also like we can formulate more general gates on a quantum computer. We can, for example, also have what's called parametrized gates where we control this rotational angle where uh, the qubit rotation of the single qubit uh, is, is controlled by an input to the quantum algorithm. And we can also have multi-qubit gates, which allow us to prepare uh, entangled non-classical states. For example, we can have a controlled NOT gate, where this upper line here uh, represents the controlled qubit. And if the controlled qubit uh, is in the one state, this target qubit gets flipped from one to zero. But the big benefit of qubits uh, comes if we bring multiple of those together. Because bringing, for example, two qubits together, uh, one like, uh, like now, for now ignoring a normalization of these states, uh, with two qubits, we can already prepare or encode four different states. If we then bring three qubits together, we end up with eight possible states of our three qubits. And you can convince yourself that actually with n qubits, we can encode exponentially, exponentially many states uh, on quantum hardware. And this is like the big promise and power of quantum computers. The problem though is we need to find new algorithms uh, for this new uh, paradigm of, of computing to actually use this potential advantage. And a big drawback of current uh, quantum hardware, uh, as you probably all also know is that we uh, have very, very uh, many flaws and limits with current quantum hardware. Like we have noise, the qubits are very easily influenced by, by outside effects like temperature. Uh, the qubits easily decohere, like they don't stay in their uh, supposed state they are in. 
and we have a very limited number of qubits uh, on current uh, quantum devices. So the idea of current approaches is that we have this hybrid quantum classical approach where we use both the pros of classical CPUs and quantum processing units uh, in conjunction. And for example, a possibility of quantum algorithms is that we use the um, QPU uh, to prepare non-classical states on quantum hardware uh, with the possibility to store uh, exponentially scaling uh, uh, states and then measure certain uh, operators of interest on quantum hardware and then use the classical computer to, for example, optimize these gate parameters uh, which uh, determine the quantum state we are uh, preparing. But still, uh, one big drawback is that we have this limited number of qubits and the depth of the circuits, like how many operations we can apply to the qubits is also very limited due to noise and decoherence. So to do quantum chemistry on quantum computers, we have to map our Hamiltonian and the spaces functions I mentioned earlier on quantum hardware. So for example, each qubit then represents one of these spaces functions occupied by up or down electrons. And then we initialize our circuit in some state, for example, the Hartree-Fox state uh, in, in this example. And then we perform operations of the quantum algorithm on the qubit and prepare like a uh, a trial state which uh, might hopefully be the ground state of our problem. But as mentioned, uh, since we have this, uh, this restrictions with the number of qubits, the circuit width and the circuit depth of how many operations we can apply, uh, it is crucial that we reduce the so-called circuit surface uh, of our quantum algorithms to actually get meaningful results due to the noise of current quantum devices. And I want to convince you now with this talk today that this transcorrelated method, which is a correlated ansatz, can reduce this computational footprint on quantum hardware. And how it does it, uh, this is uh, based on a different property of the electronic wave function, the so-called cusp condition of the electronic wave function. And this cusp condition comes from the fact that if we look closely at the Coulomb potential of our molecular Hamiltonian, uh, if two electrons with the positions Ri and uh, Rj actually come very close to each other, this Coulomb potential diverges. But the electronic wave function still must be uh, finite. So as a consequence, uh, the exact wave function actually has this very, very sharp feature, this non-differentiable differentiable, uh, feature at the point where two electrons come close together. So here is a sketch of the exact electronic wave function in black, uh, which is like a mathematical fact of uh, general uh, quantum mechanically uh, electronic wave functions. The problem then is that since we are using these, uh, these basis functions to represent our quantum chemistry problem uh, on classical computers and also on quantum computers, uh, these uh, orbitals usually uh, due to other numerical uh, benefits are smooth functions. So they have a very, very hard time to mimic this very sharp uh, behavior of the electronic wave function for short electronic distances. So this then means we need more and more of these orbitals to accurately describe our problem, which then introduces to this hierarchy of methods which we have as a function of system size, it introduces uh, a new axis uh, of our problem. We not only have the system size of our problem, but we also have the basis set size which we are using. And these accurate methods still uh, or again, scale very uh, unfavorable with the number of basis function we're using and also quantum hardware, because for each of these orbitals, we need a uh, one qubit on uh, quantum hardware to represent our problem in. And if you want to reach chemical accuracy, we have to use a big basis set. And also, of course, we want to have big system sizes, uh, which we want to target for realistic systems. 
And this transcorrelated method is based on the fact that we know the, for, the form of this cusp for short electronic distances. So the idea is, why don't we use this, this information we have uh, and make an educated guess for our ground state wave function, which we formulate as a product of some function f, which we can optimize uh, with uh, classical algorithms, times now a uh, wave function, which is much, much more smoother because the sharp feature is already handled like with the first part. So the second part is much smoother. It's much easier to represent with the smooth uh, orbitals and basis sets uh, I was mentioning beforehand. And the benefit then is that with this transcorrelated method, the TC method, we get much, much better energies already with much smaller amount of basis functions and qubits. And the idea is that we transform our Hamiltonian, like the original, we plug this ansatz into the Schrödinger equation of our problem. And then instead of solving the original Hamiltonian uh, for the energy and the eigenfunction, we solve this transcorrelated Hamiltonian. We solve for the solution of this transcorrelated Hamiltonian. The consequences are that this transcorrelated Hamiltonian is not Hermitian anymore. So we have a loss of the vari variational principle. And we also have additional free body terms in this Hamiltonian. These sound like severe problems, but the big benefit, as I mentioned, is that we have much more accurate results with a smaller basis set and less qubits. The big problem and drawback, though, is that since this TC Hamiltonian is non Hermitian, uh, variational algorithms like the, the workforce, uh, the workhorse of current uh, hybrid quantum classical approaches, the variational quantum eigensolver, are not applicable for this problem. Uh, however, uh, a good thing is that uh, also a, a modern uh, algorithm, the quantum imaginary time evolution algorithm, uh, can deal with both of these problems very efficiently. And I cannot like uh, go into detail about this method. One can read more about uh, this method in, in the papers down here below. But what imaginary time evolution does is, it also, it's based on a mathematical trick by transforming the, the Schrodinger equation of a system uh, from real time to imaginary time. Uh, and then the idea is that this imaginary time evolution can project out the ground state of a problem in the long time limit uh, of this imaginary time evolution of our problem. And we can also formulate this on quantum hardware in a hybrid classical approach, where now the, the imaginary time evolution of our target state can be mapped to the change of the gate parameters with imaginary time. And opposed to VQE, we don't measure like the, the energy expectation value like we do in the VQE algorithm, but we measure these two properties, the, the metric or quantum Fisher information and the gradient uh, of our cost function on quantum hardware. And then we can obtain a system of equations to get, the, um, to get our gate parameters of our quantum ansatz for the next time step. The benefits of this approach are that we don't need any classical optimization. So VQE, for example, struggles a lot with classical optimization. But here in the uh, imaginary time evolution, we only have to solve this linear system of equation to get our uh, parameters at the next time step. And thus, it is very uh, robust against noise. And it's also applicable to open and transport problems and thus to non-hermission problems. A drawback, though, is that it's a second-order method. It's cost more costly because this metric, which we need to measure on the quantum device, scales uh, with the, the square of the number of parameters of our ansatz. And this matrix A, the metric, can be singular. So the inversion can be problematic. Just to mention briefly, like I was involved in, in work which where we tried to target both of these problems by designing uh, an approximate method, which we uh, named the QBank method, which is based on the Broiden, uh, Bro the Broiden uh, algorithm combined with adaptive momentum approaches like the Adam optimizer used in uh, machine learning approaches. Uh, and with this approach, we found uh, an immense resource reduction in the circuit evaluations and improved convergence of the quantum imaginary time evolution. 
And the idea is that we uh, approximate this metric and we don't use like the full metric, but we approximate it with terms, uh, only with first order terms involving the gradient, uh -huh, which we measure also on the quantum device of our approach. And for example, for the water molecule, we found that with this QBank method, we had like much, much less uh, number of circuit evaluations on quantum hardware compared, compared to uh, VQE optimizations, but also like quantum natural gradient and ADAM approaches. And with all these ingredients in hand, like with the transcorrelation and the imaginary time evolution, we can now look at uh, results uh, of the transcorrelated approach on quantum hardware, first for the Hubbard model, but then also for up in issue of quantum chemistry problem. And for the Hubbard model, our goal was to reduce the circuit depth of uh, our uh, ansatz on quantum hardware with this approach. And just as a reminder, the Hubbard model, it's a, it's a model for these, for example, these two-dimensional copper oxide planes in the high temperature cuprate superconductors, where um, electrons, where these two-dimensional uh, planes are mapped to a lattice problem, where electrons can hop between different lattice sites, and there is an on-site Coulomb propulsion term if two electrons are on the same site. And for the strong correlation, strong interaction regime, that's a highly uh, multi-configurational configurational and strongly correlated problem. And what we were able to show is that this transcorrelated approach allowed us to have much shorter, shallower quantum circuits to get much, much more uh, highly accurate results. What, did, what we did, for example, is we looked at the ground state solution um, for a foresight and the six side Hubbard model. And the idea is that while the full wave function of our system needs a, a longer quantum circuit to get like accurate numbers, with this transcorrelated approach, we can compact the wave function. We, we, we move correlation from the, from the wave function to the Hamiltonian, and thus we need much shorter circuits to get accurate numbers. And we were able to show that, for example, here um, using noiseless state vector simulations, but already with one layer of a unitary coupled cluster ansatz for this four and six side uh, Hubbard model, we got like orders of magnitude uh, increased accuracy. This is like the energy error with respect to the exact solution, while in blue is the original results and in red is the transcorrelated results. We chose this transcorrelation, gives you much higher accuracy for shorter quantum circuits. And we were also able to show this on real quantum hardware, uh, here only for two-side Hubbard model. So it's quite uh, only a toy model, of course. But again, like using their hardware efficient ansatz, we were able to show that this transcorrelated approach uh, yielded much, much higher accuracy uh, for this uh, hardware efficient quantum circuit compared to the original results uh, shown here in blue and uh, bright uh, pink. Let's move. Oh, great. Moving now to up in issue problems, uh, where the idea is that we want to reduce the circuit width, like we want to reduce, we want to get higher accuracy with a smaller number of qubits. And we looked, for example, at uh, start with, with very small problems like the beryllium atom, where again, this is an exact simulation uh, without noise. And the goal here is that we want to reach the so-called complete basis set limit. Like if we would have an infinite size basis set, that would be the, the exact solution which we could compare to actual experimental numbers. And the transcorrelated approach allowed us to get like with an order of magnitude less qubits, get highly accurate results close to the CBS limit like within chemical accuracy. While traditional methods need uh, hundreds of, uh, of the spin orbitals or basis sets, uh, basis uh, functions, the transcorrelated method only needs a, a dozen to get uh, uh, equally good numbers. And if we move then to a slightly bigger problem like lithium hydride, again, we were able to show that with this transcorrelated method combined with one other ingredient, like because the standard basis sets, which are tailored for these conventional approaches, they are not quite optimized for the transcorrelated method. So we were using pre-optimized orbitals uh, based on a perturbation theory calculations on conventional hardware, which are cheap to do. 
And with these ingredients, we were able to get across the whole binding curve. Like this is the total energy of the lithium hydride as a function of the bond distance of lithium and hydride. We were able to get within chemical accuracy almost across the whole binding curve with only six qubits uh, using uh, this transcorrelated approach. And to target like real numbers, we were looking at the dissociation energy of lithium hydride which is like the energy difference between this bonded lithium hydride compared to if we dissociate uh, lithium and hydride, which is actually, actually experimentally uh, measurable. And we were able to show with the transcorrelated method that we can reduce this where we would need hundreds of qubits with, without transcorrelation. We can do it with only five to 10 qubits uh, on current hardware. However, this plot shows the big influence of noise because these are noiseless simulations. While if we include the actual noise on quantum hardware, we get uh, far off this actual uh, optimal uh, result we can get. However, just as a short mention, there are efficient error mitigation techniques and we were working on a chemistry-based uh, error mitigation technique, which you can read more about in this paper because I don't have the time to go into it. But if we do this error mitigation, we were actually able to get results within chemical accuracy on actual quantum hardware, uh, which is usual nowadays, like in the cloud, with this transcorrelated approach, transcorrelated approach on current uh, hardware. We have still some big error bars, but at least, I mean, we are much, much, much uh, better uh, and closer to this uh, experimental number numbers. So, in conclusion, I hope I could show you that this transcorrelated method by partially transferring electronic correlation from the wave function to the Hamiltonian massively reduces the qubit requirements and circuit depth on current quantum hardware. And with efficient error mitigation techniques, this extends the applicability of current and near-term quantum devices to more relevant quantum chemistry problems. And I want to acknowledge and thank my collaborators uh, uh, in this project, uh, like Igor, Ali, Martin, and Ivano, and the funding uh, from the European, European Union, uh, which enables my research. And I want to thank you for your attention and sorry for being um, a few minutes over time. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find my mouse to unmute. Thank you for, for this excellent presentation. We now open the floor for questions. Anybody has a question that would like to answer, to, to get an answer to, either write it in the chat or please go ahead and speak up. So probably a dumb question, but um, have you ever thought of actually using Slater orbitals instead of Gaussians in constructing your basis sets? I mean, because basically then you're better at the cusp. It's I know you then a... you have to do the integrals numerically. Um, it's definitely not a stupid question. I mean, that's a very, very valid question. Um, but Slater orbitals, though, uh, they miss like Slater type orbitals, they capture the, the electron nuclear cusp. So the electron yeah, actually, cusp is still like a problem, even with Slater type orbitals. Yeah, but they have um, the long range is better. I mean, so you get by with better. No, definitely. I mean, using Slater type um, orbitals would. In in, uh, like like improve, but as you mentioned, I mean they have then different uh, problems in the numerics yeah. and doing all the integrations. So there's a trade-off. But of course, I mean there are different approaches, like using Slater type orbitals or also like real space approaches, uh, grid-based approaches, which yeah. could also circumvent, but again come with with different problems. I'm I'm actually old enough that I actually worked on and used codes that had actual slaters in them <laughs> and, <laughs> and also <laughs> and also the early codes that used gaussian functions you know before there were derivatives analytic that's derivatives true. that's true <laughs> but still i think i mean yes you're right i mean the long time long range behavior is definitely better but uh this electron electron cusp still is a problem so i mean it would be interesting to look at like the combination Maybe with Slater type orbitals in general. Okay, so this yeah. question was uh, okay. Go ahead. 
No, go ahead, Adrian. That's well, what I, was saying, what I was going to say is that um, thank you very much for this question. This question came from Rob Eats from IBM. And before the presentations, we collect some information from our presenters. And I would like to return the favor of asking you a question from Werner. So he said, this was in the category, do you have any questions for our industrial members, of which you are definitely one? What are the expectations and long-term plans of the industrial academic partners concerning the usefulness of quantum computers phrased differently? How patient are you, Rob, with the development of both hardware and software solutions until quantum computers can provide a real benefit to practical problems from IBM's point of view? I would say we're very impatient. <laughs> we want everything to go faster, not only our research and development, but everybody else's. And, and I mean, as you noted, Werner works with Ivano, who's in our um, Zurich research lab and is yet another quantum chemist. Um, and, and so, I mean, the, the work that uh, Werner talked about is exactly the type of work that, that I would say we, we want to be seeing the academic community doing um, because it, it greatly improves the ability for us getting sooner to be able to solve real problems and, and to be able to you know show that there is a, a quantum advantage um, in using quantum computing. Thank you. And actually, I, I admit my bias, but my belief is because of the scaling of the complexity that comes from electron correlation. And, and fundamentally in chemistry, the interesting stuff about chemistry happens when you have uh, highly correlated systems <laughs> that it's a primary area where I think we have the greatest likelihood of seeing quantum advantage. And I admit I my bias of being a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree. I agree. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Any other questions before we start with the second presentation? Uh, maybe I can also ask a question. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, Werner, it's a very nice talk. Actually, I had a uh, just like a maybe high level question about this trans correlated um, mm -hmm. mapping um, here. You kind of showed an example where like uh, uh, it kind of like actually managed to reduce like the circuit depth required to like achieve a particular energy accuracy. Um, uh, but then you also mentioned that like now the Hamiltonian becomes non Hermitian. Are there any yes. cases where this trade off is like um, unfavorable or does it always help? Um, uh, it depends. I mean, the thing is for the Hubbard model, it's a bit special because in the Hubbard model, you have a complete basis. So that's kind of the, the difference to like the quantum chemistry problem. Uh, so in the Hubbard model, still, I mean, you have an optimization, which I was not showing. I mean, this, this, this ansatz in the Hubbard model, it's like a one parameter optimization. So it's quite easy, but you can definitely make it worse. So if you do not optimize this ansatz beforehand, which is luckily cheap, um, you would get worse results. Similar for the, the quantum chemistry problem. I mean, this, this, this ansatz which you do, like in the quantum chemistry case, it's like a Chastro ansatz, which is quite commonly used, for example, in variational Monte Carlo. But if you mess up your like pre-optimization of this ansatz, uh, you get worse results. But luckily, I mean, the, the BMC community, I mean, they have a long, long standing experience with these factors. And luckily, it's also quite cheap. So it's only scaled with the cube of the number of electrons. So you don't have an exponential like prefactor hidden somewhere. So if you do this properly, uh, you usually get improvements. Although, I mean, if you scale to bigger systems, also transition metal uh, uh, systems, I mean, one has to uh, be careful. I mean, it, it can also. Uh, deteriorate sometimes. Gotcha. Okay. And, Very and the uh, importance of doing the the optimized natural orbitals to use those as the basis in the chemistry problem. This was just like uh, I mean I, I I was thinking of ways to 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 really get the, the best bang out of the buck. I think that's the phrase. Um, and I mean, I started with different type of orbitals. I was first like doing CASA CF orbitals, but then that kind of felt like cheating because I mean, CASA CF, I mean, if you can do that, I mean, 
I mean, there is no, I mean, it, it, it's an exponential scaling uh, approach. Yeah. So then I was going to more like cheaply optimized orbitals, but I just found that it really, really increases the, 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 the strength of the method. And I guess mainly because, I mean, this, as you know, this Gaussian type orbitals, uh, this, for example, the, the correlation consistent type orbitals, I mean, they are optimized for these conventional approaches. They are not optimized for this TC approach. But there's also like other work from other people now doing like transcorrelated orbital optimization. So like doing this whole orbital optimization process uh, within a transcorrelated framework to get even better orbitals. But that's still, still work in progress, I think. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm not very sure what I'm sharing, but my hope is that I'm sharing the full-blown slide for today that shows the two presenters. We had three presented, uh, registered, but one of them has health problems. So with thanks to Werner for his uh, great presentation uh, and, and to everybody for the questions, including Nishad for the last question, I think we're ready to get started with the second uh, presentation. And uh, now if Nishad would like to take the screen away from me, I'm just gonna say a few words about him. As you can see on the slides, he's a graduate student in Mikhail Lukin's group at Harvard working on designing hardware tailored approaches and applications for near-term quantum simulation problems. Um, he has worked on theoretical problems in many body quantum systems, including far from equilibrium dynamics and topological order. He did his undergraduate studies at Caltech where, where he worked on machine learning approaches for quantum error correction and classifying phases. So with this, Misha, take it away. I'm gonna, yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, can you try to put it in presentation mode? Yes. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you, Adrian, for the invitation to talk today. Um, I'm very excited to tell you guys about a, a project we've been uh, recently wrapping up on um, developing uh, hardware efficient approaches for quantum simulation of, in particular, um, some classes of strongly correlated molecules and materials. Um, with an emphasis on uh, a new quantum simulation architecture that we're calling reconfigurable atom arrays. Um, and I just want to highlight that uh, this is kind of a collaboration between a few different groups, including the Lucan group at Harvard, along with um, Susanna Yellen's group at Harvard, as well as the group of Martin Head Gordon um, at UC Berkeley. Um, okay, so uh, just to give a sense of kind of like the community that I come from and kind of the motivation for uh, the stuff that we are um, going to be talking about today uh, is uh, the field of programmable quantum simulators. So um, the kind of goal of a programmable quantum simulator is to, um, you know, using uh, like uh, simple hardware controls, um, uh, for example, like optical lattices or um, atoms and tweezers, uh, generate some type of uh, uh, efficiently generate some type of interacting quantum anybody system as a route to kind of understanding and probing features of quantum anybody dynamics and um, exotic quantum phases. Um, so, you know, in particular, like an uh, example of this approach, which people um, have been uh, pursuing over the last decade or so, are um, kind of like uh, analog simulation um, approaches to studying things like the Fermi Hubbard model. Um, and, you know, the nice things about these analog um, quantum simulators is that they can generate interactions very efficiently. Um, however, if we wanted to try to now take the tools of quantum simulation and try to tackle them um, for and try to use them to tackle kind of more real world use cases, for example, uh, problems inspired by quantum chemistry or material science, we actually need some way of, um, you know, we need a lot more flexibility than a standard analog approach would give us. In particular, we need some way of um, uh, efficiently engineering uh, programmable interactions. So what we're gonna do today is kind of show how um, we can use some new um, ideas in the quantum simulation community in order to naturally introduce uh, a degree of programmability into these kind of analog quantum devices. So, you know, kind of on the, um, on, like the other side of quantum simulation for quantum chemistry are um, quantum uh, chemistry proposals that are uh, built on, that are like tailored in particular for um, like quantum computer type devices. So um, actually recently some very nice resource estimates from the Microsoft group 
uh, essentially looked into how hard would it be to solve different types of um, quantum chemistry problems on a fault tolerant quantum architecture. And uh, if you just look at like the numbers that they were able to produce, um, the results are actually kind of uh, disheartening at first. In particular, you know, if you look at like a quantum chemistry application here, you see that like the, you know, runtime that they suggest is something that would take like months or centuries. And it's assuming that all of the uh, quantum computing architecture uh, kind of comes together uh, as projected. Um, now, there's many uh, sources of overhead that lead to such a large estimate. Um, in particular, you know, some of the things which contribute to this overhead are like the complicated mapping of a quantum chemistry problem onto, you know, digital quantum hardware. Um, also, the particular algorithm that they uh, studied, a quantum phase estimation algorithm, is among the most expensive of the quantum chemistry algorithms that uh, people discuss. And lastly, they also considered kind of the like fault tolerant regime of a full error corrected quantum computer. And so a lot of these contributions also come from um, the overhead from quantum error correction. Uh, however, you do see that when you compare like a full quantum chemistry calculation to something more like quantum dynamics, where here they just studied the 2D Ising model, um, uh, the dynamics problems do seem to be qualitatively quite a bit easier because you know, some of these uh, sources of overheads can be significantly reduced. Um, so you know, another way of kind of uh, phrasing what we're going to be doing today is trying to see if we can solve certain classes of interesting chemistry and materials problems um, using kind of tools that allow us to simulate quantum dynamics. OK, so with that, um, let me maybe uh, dive into the particular approach that we're going to be um, proposing uh, and discussing today. So um, the approach is going to be essentially based around these ideas of model Hamiltonians. So at a very high level, the way that model Hamiltonians work is let's say you have some uh, complicated electronic structure problem. Uh, for example, here is a molecule from biochemistry, or we could also consider something which is more of, from like material science. Um, the idea is to use uh, powerful classical computational uh, chemistry techniques as a way of uh, reducing the problem onto something which is much easier to simulate on quantum hardware. Um, in particular, if you like, say, for example, look at this biochemistry molecule, you'll see that some of these sites are transition metals. And um, these transition metals have lots of unpaired valence electrons. And in particular, in certain molecules, um, some number of these unpaired valence electrons will uh, remain unpaired, uh, even at very low energies. And in particular, they, if they localize onto these sites, then they form um, effective spin degrees of freedom. And these uh, spin degrees of freedom will have uh, interactions which essentially dominate the low energy physics of these molecules and materials. Um, so these interaction parameters can actually be computed classically using some of the approaches um, that came from uh, Martin Headgordon's group. Um, and in general, they like lead to some type of in like very complicated spin Hamiltonian. Um, so it could you know, have uh, spin interactions, uh, like single body spin interactions, two body spin interactions, and in general, even higher order spin interactions. Um, and furthermore, each of the individual spin degrees of freedom um, aren't necessarily spin one half degrees of freedom, but could, you know, be more naturally described as a larger spin, for example, like a spin three half degree of freedom. So our goal today is going to be to build a toolbox for um, doing simulation of these model spin Hamiltonians, whose low energy properties are actually very hard to compute classically, because in some sense, these model Hamiltonians uh, distill the strongly correlated part of the um, electronic structure problem, which is most difficult to solve classically. Uh, however, even though uh, you know, we use this idea of model Hamiltonian to significantly reduce the complexity of the problem, um, uh, quantum simulation of these model Hamiltonians itself is actually um, in practice quite challenging. And in particular, the two key features which are going to make this implementation difficult are the fact that each of the constituent spins are greater than one half, so we have high spin degrees of freedom. And second, that the connectivity of this uh, model Hamiltonian isn't necessarily, um, you know, local uh, planar in 2D. Um, in general, we're going to develop a procedure where we can handle non-local generic connectivity um, in these uh, spin Hamiltonians. Okay, so uh, with that, actually, I'll pause for a couple of seconds in case anyone has any questions.
All right, and if not, I guess uh, everything has been explained very clearly, so I will uh, continue on. So here's kind of the outline for what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'm going to explain a hardware specific proposal for how we would go about controlling these high spin degrees of freedom. Then I'll explain um, uh, how we can implement non local connectivity uh, using uh, kind of a new experimental tool, which are the reconfigurable atom arrays. And then lastly, I'll discuss kind of, um, you know, uh, essentially how would we, how would an experiment look in practice? How would we, uh, how would we perform something like state preparation and what types of measurements would we want to make in order to extract the types of properties which uh, we're targeting when we're trying to solve materials and chemistry problems. Okay, so uh, let's start with controlling high spin. So uh, as I mentioned, one of the challenges in this model Hamiltonian approach are encoding high dimensional spin degrees of freedom. And the approach that we're gonna take to encode these spin degrees of freedom is to essentially encode a spin in a cluster of spin one halves or qubits. Um, so this is kind of an intuitive idea. Um, so for a spin one, we would encode this in the triplet states of two qubits. And in general, we can write the high spin operators as like a sum of spin one half operators. Um, now, uh, in the specific Rydberg platform, um, qubits are stored in a uh, long lived stable hyperfine manifold, which are kind of denoted here by up states and down states. And interactions between qubits are generated by coupling to an excited Rydberg state, here denoted by R. Um, and uh, existing um, experiments have shown how uh, driving the qubit up state to the Rydberg state um, allows you to efficiently generate all to all symmetric interactions. So um, in particular, these Rydberg states interact with other Rydberg states very strongly. So if you place a cluster of atoms very close together, then the Rydberg repulsion energy is so strong that only one atom can occupy the Rydberg state at a time. Um, this type of interaction is actually uh, permutationally symmetric all of the atoms look the same with respect to each other. So if you swap around the order, um, it doesn't change the nature of the interaction. And as a result, you can use this to efficiently generate um, symmetric diagonal interactions. So in uh, recent uh, experiments from our group, we showed how you can use this interaction to generate a three qubit uh, quantum logic operation, uh, CCZ gate, um, using a simple time dependent pulse profile, which was optimized using some optimal control techniques. Um, and uh, what we found actually is that when we, uh, and this, what we found is that without too much optimization, we were actually able to, you know, achieve this with an experimentally measured fidelity of the three qubit gate, which was um, pretty high, around 98%. So um, for comparison, the two qubit gate fidelity here is 99.5%. So this three qubit gate actually outperforms the corresponding decomposition to two qubits. Um, so as a result, you know, these uh, multi-qubit gates kind of seem like they might be promising for, you know, near-term NISC type applications. Um, so what we do in this work is we actually, um, in theory, extend these, uh, this type of symmetric control over a cluster of qubits to also now include time-dependent driving, time driving of the hyperfine manifold. Um, and in particular, by simultaneously driving both this Rydberg transition and this hyperfine transition, we see that we can engineer collective spin interactions. So, you know, our goal is to engineer ultimately spin um, Hamiltonians. So a particularly useful gate is um, something that looks like e to the minus i theta s squared, where uh, s squared is the collective spin operator. And, you know, this s squared operation includes, you know, both spin exchange and also Ising type interactions. So it contains off diagonal elements as well. And we see that when we do our optimal control, um, when we run the same optimal control pipeline on uh, this uh, more complicated pulse optimization problem, uh, the uh, resulting gate times actually scale pretty favorably with the number of qubits that are interacting simultaneously. Um, in particular, if we demand a very high degree of accuracy, something on the order of 10 to the minus 6, then we see a scaling that's roughly linear in the number of qubits. But if we're um, okay with uh, slightly, uh, with uh, also pretty high, but um, looser threshold on the order of 10 to the minus three, then we actually find that we can engineer this gate using almost constant time um, with the number of qubits. Uh, so, you know, in particular, these approximate gates could be quite promising 
for a near term, you know, uh, analog almost type simulation of these uh, interacting spin Hamiltonians. Okay, so uh, with that, next I'll discuss um, how we could try to encode non local connectivity using uh, the reconfigurable atom array platform. Um, but I guess before I go into that section, maybe I'll pause here and ask if there's any questions about the uh, gate construction. So since you're pausing from time to time, maybe I can encourage people, if they have questions that they would like to get answered during one of these pauses, they could type them in the chat. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. OK, and I'll keep going for now. Um, but Adrian, if you get any questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, OK, so uh, next we'll discuss the non-local connectivity um, and how we would implement this using reconfigurable arrays. So, um, you know, another key challenge, which is particularly important if we want to simulate um, models of materials which are inspired by um, physically uh, realistic problems, is the non-local connectivity. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the key tools we're going to leverage is um, was recently demonstrated in kind of two experimental papers from our group where they showed that um, when you take qubits that are encoded in these hyperfine states in optical tweezers, you can actually coherently move, you can uh, coherently transport this qubit degree of freedom simply by moving the tweezer without introducing much air. So, you know, the quantum information in the qubit is actually preserved under this transportation. Um, and in particular, they measure this error rate to be below 10 to the minus 5. So it's actually quite high fidelity, in particular, compared to something like a 2 qubit gate fidelity. Um, so the approach that we're going to take here is to use this ability to move atoms as a way of dynamically changing the configuration in the middle of our quantum simulation. In particular, we're going to alternate between different configurations as a way of realizing a sequence of Hamiltonians. And then by realizing the sequence of Hamiltonians, we're going to be able to simulate the target dynamics by using um, essentially Floquet engineering or time dependent Hamiltonian engineering to engineer the appropriate effective Hamiltonian. So let's go through this with a simple example. Um, let's consider a target Hamiltonian that acts on high spin degrees of freedom with some arbitrary two qubit interaction. Uh, this interaction is in general highly programmable. For example, it could be some combination of a symmetric Heisenberg type interaction and an anti-symmetric DM type interaction, both of which arise in real materials um, due to different underlying physical phenomena. Um, so in the first step of the procedure, we would reconfigure the atoms such that representatives from each of the large spins um, interact with each other. Uh, then we would apply a two qubit gate, which essentially encodes this symmetric and anti-symmetric interaction just at the level of the interacting spin one halves. Um, so the important thing is that in this step, because these clusters were connected by a non-local move, you can use these two qubit interactions as a way of mediating generic long range connectivity um, between the underlying large spin degrees of freedom. However, this interaction in general violates the large spin encoding because it doesn't respect the permutation symmetry within each cluster. Um, so because it, doesn't, um, inf uh, because it doesn't respect the large spin encoding into this cluster of qubits, we need to apply a second step. This time we're going to apply a gate which acts within each cluster. And the purpose of this second gate is to create an energy gap between the symmetric states and the states that are not symmetric. Or in other words, between the states that are encoded, that encode the high spins and the rest of the Hilbert space. And um, in particular, when we apply this gate, it's going to you know, apply an energy or a phase to the uh, terms in HI, which changed, which took us away from this encoding space. Um, so once we have this ability to engineer both HI and HC, uh, we can actually use ideas from Floquet engineering and in particular, some very nice work from this uh, uh, PRX here showed that by engineering an appropriate sequence of frames uh, where you carefully choose the time evolution times under HC and HI, um, on average, you can ensure that this HI Hamiltonian realizes the target Hamiltonian up here. So, you know, the key idea is that um, we took a simpler spin one half Hamiltonian and project it onto a more complicated higher spin Hamiltonian. Um, using these Fouquet engineering ideas. Um, good. So uh, let's kind of quickly discuss uh, how we can uh, understand the performance of this approach um, and compare it against like conventional two qubit based approaches. So uh, there's kind of uh, two key um, 
benefits of the Floquet projection approach. First is that it allows you to engineer shorter Floquet sequences, as we'll see shortly, which actually reduces the kind of propagation and buildup of Floquet errors. The second is that uh, because we're using multi-qubit gates, and we've in, uh, showed this you know, ability to efficiently apply multi-qubit gates, um, this also allows us to more efficiently generate certain complex interactions which appear in real systems. Um, however, you know, the downside is that when we do this Floquet projection procedure, it in general also introduces some gate overhead. So we're going to need to find situations where the benefits from these first two um, outweigh the overhead from the third. So the first system, the first system we're going to think about is a very simple one, where we just have two interacting large spin degrees of freedom. Uh, so imagine these two spin degrees of freedom are interacting with some coupling coefficient j over 2s, where this normalization is chosen so that the energy of this Hamiltonian is extensive. Uh, then we can think about uh, two different approaches. And actually, I realize I flipped the colors here, so apologies for that, um, where uh, uh, the Trotter approach, which actually corresponds to the orange line here, is a, where, corresponds to the one where uh, the different pairs of spins between the different clusters are grouped into um, five interactions at a time. And uh, so here we're thinking about like a spin five half uh, or the rightmost point here. And because there's in this S squared term here, um, 25 two qubit interactions, five times five, we can split these 25 interactions up into five mutually commuting groups. Uh, and the, in the Trotter approach, we would simply apply these five mutually commuting groups one after another. Um, for a generic spin size, the number of steps we would need scales as 2s. So for spin 2, this would require four steps. For spin 5 half, this requires five steps. And um, as you see, the length of the Floquet sequence needed in order to um, uh, realize this interaction just using two qubit gates uh, actually grows with the size of the spin. And as a result, the maximum evolution time that we can uh, simulate for a given error budget um, actually decreases with the spin size uh, for this simple example. In contrast, the Floquet approach um, involves using this uh, multi-qubit interaction that generates an energy gap, and then just one of these groups of five. And even though this group of five doesn't respect the spin symmetry, this uh, multi-qubit interaction allows us to effectively project it onto the target large spin interaction. And when we do this, when we um, uh, simulate this approach and compute the accessible evolution time, uh, we actually see that this approach doesn't seem to scale with the spin size. So um, because uh, this scaling uh, is better than the Trotter approach, um, if we now introduce also uh, you know, the gate overhead that comes from adding this extra projection step, we see that there's kind of a trade-off. So when the spin size is very small for this simple uh, Hamiltonian, you actually would want to use the Trotter approach compared to this full K projection. Um, however, as the spin size grows, eventually you'd want to switch to a Floquet projection approach in order to maximize your evolution time. And the simulation framework that we're describing here is actually flexible enough that um, you can switch between the Trotter and the Floquet kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. So this uh, two interacting large spin Hamiltonian is kind of the simplest example um, where we can do uh, detailed numerical studies. Um, however, we also anticipate that as we increase the complexity of the underlying spin Hamiltonian, for example, by increasing the uh, number of interactions that each high spin participates in, and also, you know, also considering the effect of higher order interactions, for example, um, s dot s squared or s dot s cubed interactions by uh, by quadratic and by cubic interactions, which also appear in real materials, um, the multi qubit uh, Floquet projection approach, um, the scaling advantages really start to pay off. So um, in particular, if we consider something like a spin two model on a square lattice uh, with um, two qubit uh, like uh, s dot s squared interactions and also like something uh, like an AKLT style Hamiltonian, which in general would require going all the way up to s dot s to the fourth, um, we see that these multi qubit interactions described before can significantly outperform the corresponding two qubit interactions just because engineering these interactions is very expensive. So um, we also checked how expensive it would be to um, do some two qubit decompositions of something like, say, s dot s to the fourth. And uh, that would here correspond to this column four here. 
And we see that the two qubit decomposition scaling is very, very expensive when compared to the multi qubit case. Um, so as the complexity of the interactions and the connectivity also grows, um, this Floquet projection approach seems like it'd be more favorable um, in the more complicated limits. Okay, so uh, good. So, um, so far I've discussed how we could use this toolbox as a way of engineering uh, Hamiltonian time evolution. However, we can also use the same um, hardware simulation framework in order to uh, simulate high spin circuits. So the simplest way to think about this is that when we apply this alternating combination of HI and HC, it realizes some effective Hamiltonian HF. And uh, by changing the coupling coefficients in the HI interaction and the rotation angles here, you can essentially tune this HF uh, Hamiltonian that you apply. And you can do this kind of on a layer by layer basis. So in that sense, this allows us to implement high spin circuits. Uh, specifically in the circuit case, uh, we can also consider further optimization of the rotation angles um, in order to engineer more complicated interactions very efficiently. So here actually is an alternate route to engineering something like a S dot S cubed interaction, where we variationally optimize a sequence where we alternate two qubit gates and three qubit gates for two interacting spin three halves. And we see that um, in this case, you actually also have a lot of control over the higher order interactions. Um, specifically because of the higher order commutators that appear in this uh, Floquet expansion. Um, so, uh, you know, at a very cartoon level, uh, what this allows us to do is actually have now like a fundamental building block, which is like a high spin two qubit gate with very tunable two qubit uh, gate parameters. Um, and we can piece this together in order to realize a variety of different state preparation circuits. Um, where, you know, it's kind of a context dependent thing, which one of these would be the best thing to use. So, for example, we could imagine using some type of adiabatic state preparation. We could also use uh, VQE or um, imaginary time evolution state preparation approaches, or we could also use some um, ideas related to directly encoding tensor network states um, in our quantum simulator as another potential state preparation approach. Okay. So uh, with that, that kind of wraps up the section on how we would um, implement non-local connectivity and efficiently engineer interactions using this uh, framework. Um, so maybe I'll also pause again for more questions in case there are any. I don't see any in the chat. Okay, great. Then we can continue onwards. Um, so the last section of the talk is with regards to, uh, you know, state preparation is with regards to essentially efficient readout. So um, uh, if we wanted to do like a useful quantum simulation, uh, what, we, what we would like to produce at the end of the quantum simulation is some type of chemical property or material property. And one potential target is like the low energy spectrum of a molecular material. So the approach which we're gonna use is um, to combine the efficient time dynamics. So all the stuff I just described in terms of Hamiltonian simulation is essentially a way of efficiently implementing time dynamics in the Rydberg atom simulator, um, and also uh, projective measurements, which are kind of the natural measurements that you get when you do quantum simulation. So for example, projectively measure uh, each qubit in say the Z basis. Um, so, uh, and you know, the key idea here is that these measurements are super information dense. Uh, and so by combining um, time evolution and projective measurements, uh, we can extract a lot of information about the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So the envisioned circuit involves uh, state preparation and then also a controlled perturbation step, which can also be implemented using this uh, digital high spin circuit toolbox I described in the last slide, uh, followed by time evolution and ultimately projective measurements. And when you uh, apply this type of circuit, what you're essentially doing is performing an interferometry experiment between some uh, reference eigenstate, uh, this S state, and a probe state, which is prepared by this controlled perturbation, which we're going to call R. Um, and when we do this snapshot measurement, it allows us to essentially access all operators, which are diagonal in the measurement basis. So um, I don't have time today, unfortunately, to get into the details of this, but uh, we've been developing some kind of hybrid algorithms, uh, which do some classical processing, uh, significant classical processing of the snapshot measurements, um, as a way of extracting detailed information about the spectrum. And so here's kind of an example of what you would see 
when you apply this procedure to a simple model with two interacting large spins. So, um, you know, first, if you just look at this black curve here, you could compute something like a density of states. Um, so this model has, uh, you know, um, two interacting spin three halves has four eigenstates corresponding to S equals zero all the way up to S equals three uh, total spin S. Um, and the black curve roughly traces, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the spectral weight um, where each of these peaks is broadened due to um, finite uh, maximum evolution time, which, which ultimately comes from um, the limited coherence time of, uh, you know, a real quantum simulator, for example. Now, in the density of states, you do see peaks corresponding to each of the different energies, um, but because of the spectral broadening, you actually see that two of the peaks start to mix together and they're very hard to distinguish. So uh, one of the powerful things about the toolbox that we've been developing in this, uh, uh, in this context is that you can also compute the density of states, but now weighted by different observables. So if, for example, the observable we choose is like a projector onto spin equals zero and spin equals one, then we can independently resolve these two eigenstates, which just in the bare density of states uh, are kind of like spectrally brought in together. So, um, you know, the kind of key takeaway is that uh, using this, um, these time dynamics uh, experiments, uh, you can compute this density of states uh, with different observables plugged in here. And by plugging in different observables to compute this uh, operator resolved density of states, you can probe different information about the form of the, um, about the form of the spectrum. Okay. Uh, so uh, just also to quickly flash, um, we can also use these techniques to compute uh, finite temperature properties, uh, things like the magnetic susceptibility um, in post-processing, also all just from the same type of data set. So you can kind of choose the type of thing that you want to compute after the fact um, from the same data set. Okay, and uh, without getting into it in too much detail, uh, the expression that we use to actually compute this operator resolved density of states um, is actually kind of complicated, but kind of decomposes nicely into three different types of parts. Um, so first, we have random sampling over, you know, evolution times and perturbations. And these random samples can just be generated um, kind of classically. They kind of tell you the different ways in which you're going to initialize your experiment. Um, then there's a component of the correlation function, which only depends on zero time data. Um, so because this only depends on zero time data, uh, we kind of propose to use like efficient classical techniques as a way of computing the zero time correlation functions. Then we're going to only use the quantum uh, computer in order to compute uh, the time evolved correlation functions. And in general, because the quantum computer has shot noise, uh, this is always going to come with some like large error bars, which depend on the total number of snapshots that uh, we were able to take. So decay, you know, roughly is one over square root m, where m is the number of snapshots. And by splitting the procedure up into zero time and time t data, this actually allows us to make this density of states calculation more sample efficient. So that's kind of the key takeaway for why we want to do a hybrid classical quantum um, approach to uh, processing these snapshot measurements. Okay, and so then uh, the last thing I'd like to discuss is just some, you know, uh, kind of toy examples where we illustrate how this pr uh, procedure could be used in uh, different application contexts. So uh, first, you know, as we discussed um, uh, way at the beginning in the model Hamiltonian context, we could imagine doing a simulation of some, uh, you know, uh, biochemical catalyst such as the oxygen evolving complex. Um, so uh, nice uh, chemistry papers have shown how uh, the low energy physics can essentially be captured by, um, you know, a Heisenberg model with uh, large spins and four sites. So this is still small enough that we can simulate all this um, classically in order to benchmark our approach. And in particular, we've uh, run kind of these algorithms and we see that the algorithms can, in principle, you know, extract the low lying uh, spin ladder of this uh, biochemical catalyst. So the spin ladder is something which can also be measured in experiment and can be used to kind of compare uh, whether the um, experimentally measured results are kind of consistent with your microscopic model um, of the original structure. Um, okay. And uh, the second kind of example is something uh, like a 2D ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. So this uh, 2D ferromagnetic Heisenberg model um, is also uh, quite simple um, if we only work in the one spin flip sector, because then we can do all of our calculations classically in order to benchmark the approach. 
Um, but what we could do in this context, because this is an extended 2D material, is measure something like a two-point uh, space uh, and time uh, two-point correlation function. Uh, so for example, if you apply a perturbation at site zero, as the system evolves in time, you're going to see that this perturbation spreads, and it's also going to have, you know, like some positive and negative kind of sinusoidal type profile as you move out from the location of the perturbation. So by just simply computing, you know, the spectral weight, which is the Fourier transform um, of these two time correlation functions, you can compute things like the, um, like the dispersion of the low lying excitations in this model. Um, and in general, because it's a two dimensional model, we have some two dimensional dispersion. Uh, so, um, you know, these are some sample calculations which illustrate how this pipeline could be used when applied in, you know, complex material or chemistry application context. All right, and uh, with that, uh, I'd like to, you know, quickly just summarize all the things that I discussed. So first, we discussed how you can use these model Hamiltonians just kind of as a simplified picture for the low energy physics of different types of materials and how there's systematic tools for computing um, these model Hamiltonians um, in kind of an ab initio way. Uh, and then kind of the core of our work has been showing how you can take these model Hamiltonians and encode them on our programmable quantum simulator and then use the di resulting dynamics as a way of computing, you know, properties that we care about, such as the low energy spectra. All right. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators. Um, in particular, this has been a large collaboration between both computational chemists as well as, um, you know, uh, quantum optics and quantum simulation folks, which is kind of my background as well. Um, all right, and thank you all for your attention too. Great, Nishat, for this. Uh, I have a question. What are some open scientific problems which could potentially be targeted with your proposed framework, if you have time? Uh, yeah, so um, that's a good question. Uh, and I guess the uh, proposed, you know, some interesting target problems actually live, are in this like 2D magnetic materials land. Um, so uh, in general, like, 2D spin systems are pretty hard to study classically. Um, people have been making a lot of progress doing these using uh, classical approaches like DMRG. Um, however, uh, you know, because our implementation kind of naturally enables us to engineer complex spin interactions, one potential target would be to study like 2D Kataev type materials, uh, where you know things like the ground state phase diagram and uh, whether certain phases are gapped or gapless kind of remain open questions. Uh, so it'd be super exciting if we were able to use um, a quantum device in order to make progress on these problems which people have been studying for decades um, in uh, existing condensed matter community. So. Okay, any other questions? Anybody else? I wish I had more questions, but it's very late here. <laughs> Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, that was really, really amazing. A, a small question. The, the last uh, stuff you mentioned about the spectral density, is this somehow related to work from people from Oxford? I think they call it something shadow spectroscopy. Uh, like similar to, to to classical shadows, but I mean it was related also with the, they also measure uh, multiple observable observables, but um yeah, I was not quite yes. sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this is a there's kind of a whole toolbox of algorithms I think which I've been lumping in with statistical phase estimation approaches, mm -hmm. where you use kind of like um, classical Fourier transforms in order to extract spectral quantities. Yeah. And yeah, I'm familiar with this uh, shadow spectroscopy approach. Um, the specific algorithms that we use are a little bit different. We do this kind of like classical quantum hybrid calculation, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, requires a little more knowledge about the zero time state that we have. And as a result, we're actually mm -hmm. able to extract a little more about the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's part of this kind of like large class of algorithms now where people are doing classical Fourier transforms instead of the quantum <laughs> Fourier transform to uh target spectral quantities on near-term devices yeah but it's, it's not out yet or did i or is this this one's not out work? yet no so yeah okay. so we're, we've been working hard to get this thing done and hopefully it'll I'm be looking out. forward to it yeah so as far as the video recording uh nishad how, how long would you like us to hold off to post the video recording what do you think uh so we plan to have this thing done i think like within a month 
Yeah. Uh -huh. So I could also just email you once it's out and. So I could split it into two, uh, post one very right away. I mean, if Werner is okay with that. And then in the next month, whenever you email me, I'll add the second one. If that's okay. That sounds good to me, yeah. So then you don't have any limitations or constraints on how soon I post your uh, uh, recording, right? No, no. Okay, good. Then I'll split it into two and I'll wait to hear from you. Okay, fantastic. Anybody else with any other questions before we uh, go away? Maybe one more from my side then. <laughs> um, did, maybe I missed it, uh, but you, how do you get the, the J1, J2? You, you, the J1, J2 you don't get from previous calculations or experiment, or you uh, kind no. of tweak it to the problem case? Because I mean, sometimes getting these parameters is, 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 is very problematic on its own. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a good question. And actually, like, uh, our current understanding is okay, so essentially what we've done is we've developed a toolbox for implementing these Hamiltonians, you know. So, you know, if a computational chemist comes along and says, I have a Hamiltonian that I would like to simulate, uh, we've been essentially developing tools to go ahead and do those simulations. Um, you are correct that uh, in general, computing these uh, coefficients for these higher order interactions is like a challenging computational chemistry problem. Um, so like my collaborators have said, I think have like mentioned different ideas for how to do this efficiently. Um, one way which I can comment on quickly is like these uh, spin flip approaches. So like Martin's group has essentially um, a couple works where they like show how if you like do DFT calculations and like the all spin up state um, using some like broken symmetry DFT and then like flip each of the spins and then run another DFT calculation. From those energy differences, you can just fit a Heisenberg Hamiltonian, which at least gets the spectrum mostly right in this sector. And they kind of show that in many cases it propagates to the rest of the sectors too. Um, and if you wanted to now probe like biquadratic terms, you would need to probe like two spin flip sectors. So your scaling would grow by a factor of N, but um, in principle, that's like one approach. Yeah. Although I think like, um, figuring out how to systematically compute these coefficients is also like an interesting problem in computational chemistry itself yeah that's true, that's true. thanks thanks Adam. yeah thanks for the question okay well if anybody if nobody else has any questions then i'd like to thank our presenters uh for today again for their um time and energy and um eloquence and um, with this, our session for September is over. Our next session is going to be in November. We already have a presenter uh, signed up. The topic of that uh, theme of that session is going to be quantum control tentatively. So Nishad, Werner, thank you once again. And with this, goodbye. And we'll see you in the future. Bye-bye.